Uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much uh, for that very nice introduction. And thanks to the organizers for um, their hospitality and inviting me. Uh, it's been an interesting meeting. It's not my community. Uh, so I still haven't met most of you, so if I haven't met you below, um, you can talk to me after if you want. Uh, and um, so since, since I'm coming from a bit of a different community, I, I decided that I should give a kind of a pedagogical talk. It's not going to be a long uh, sequence of my own research, although I'll drop things in here and there, as everyone does, but uh, try to give you a feel for where climate forecasting, what it's about, and, and where it's at as best I can, given the fact that I'm not a forecaster myself, so some of this stuff, I, there may be people here who know more about it than I do, and they can correct me if I speak. So, but um, what, what do I actually do is I study this. So this is my, most of the job that I do is to try to understand everything you're seeing here. So why do we get these clusters of cloud systems? Why do we get deep cloud systems here and shallow ones over there? Uh, why are some of them more persistent? Um, and how do we learn how to represent this in a model of the climate system which can't possibly hope to resolve all of the detailed behavior that you see? So we have to learn some stuff about this figure out how to represent it in equations so that it's taken on board by the model even though it's not simulating every single uh, that's there. Um, and you can see things happening over the islands. I've done some work looking at why it is that islands trigger these storms and um, well lots of other things which I'm not going to talk about today. It's not a atmospheric physics talk. Uh, what I'm going to do um, instead is try to give you an introduction to the climate problem and then go through short-term forecasting, which is really all about um, the initial condition, but also boundary conditions that will be changing in time. And then uh, talk about the long-term forecasting problem, which is one that's probably closer to my own research. And hopefully there'll be lots of time to get your questions and see, see how that goes. So um, just to start off with one thing that people here probably know that confuses some people, is uh, we know that there is a limit of predictability for weather. So what we have here is a sort of standard weather chart that weather, weather we need to look at 500 millibar height field. And uh, the H's and L's are showing highs and lows. And on the upper left here, uh, which says analysis, is what eventuated uh, at the end of the forecast period. So this is the truth. And then this is what was forecast one day earlier. That's what was forecast three days earlier, five, seven, and 10 days earlier. And uh, what you can see is that um, one day earlier, they, they did a very good job. But then as you go back, by the time you get to day seven and 10, uh, you start to see that a lot of the features that you want to get uh, are either in the wrong place or don't exist. Although on the other hand, there's still um, some skill. And there's numbers down here at the bottom showing RMS differences of height and, and uh, skill uh, percentages. So uh, this is just to say that um, we have a horizon of maybe a week or two. And that becomes more obvious when you go back and look at different ensemble maps. So the way weather forecasts are done nowadays is you don't just run your model once. You run it uh, maybe a couple of dozen times and you perturb the initial conditions. And in some cases, you also perturb the model. And you get an ensemble, and then um, you try to use those to capture the spread of the PDF of the thing you're trying to forecast. And what you can see here, this is the average of all the ensemble members at day seven. Here's the one which turned out to be the best. Of course, you don't know that until after the forecast eventuates. Uh, and this is one that turned out to be the worst. And so there was one that's actually doing quite well, even though it's day seven, but then there's others that are doing very poorly. And then it's the spread of these, because these are small perturbations in the initial condition, is telling you something about the limit of what the predictability is possible in principle, even if your model were perfect. It can it predict itself? So here's a problem where we can address a topic that I've heard come up in a few of the talks at the meeting, which is, you know, do you know whether you should be asking whether something's predictable at all before you try to predict it? And um, this, this is because of chaos, of course, which was discovered by Ed Lorenz uh, at MIT when he was writing down a model for the, for the larger wavelength waves that you see in these diagrams. And notice that if he chopped off one digit from his model and ran it again, it started to give him a different answer after a couple weeks. And he realized the importance of that 
uh, and published a paper which nobody paid any attention to for a while, and is now one of the most landmark papers of 20th century science, um, called Determinist of Non-Periodic Flow. And, um, and so we know that the predictability limit is a couple of weeks. Okay, so uh, you can't do any better than that. I can't tell you what the weather's going to be in a month from now. And you can't blame the organizers for the fact that it's been raining at this conference, because they did not have any way of knowing that that was going to happen. However, uh, here I am standing here telling you that I can make climate predictions. So obviously there's something going on uh, that enables me to say that I can predict something more than two weeks ahead, even though I've just told you that we can't. And so, for example, um, the first prediction of global warming was made in 1896. And uh, quantitatively, it's not that far off of what we believe now. I just don't know if it's true, but it's at least a consistent forecast over a very long period of time. Uh, the founder of the IPCC, Bert Bollin, in 1959, predicted how fast carbon dioxide would rise in Earth's atmosphere, and he was pretty close. Uh, he predicted by 2000 where it would be, and he wasn't off by much. Uh, exponential growth is fairly predictable, and that's kind of what we had so far. Uh, Stratospheric cooling was predicted by um, Navi and Weatherall in 1967, and by the 1990s we had observed it in data. This is from greenhouse gases and ozone depletion. And uh, this same uh, thing here, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, issued its first climate report assessing the science in 1990, and there's been a number since then. I worked on the fourth and fifth one and uh, put out predictions of warming in the future. And if you go back and look now, they, they're pretty close, they're pretty accurate. And we've known about this problem long enough that every US president since Lyndon Johnson, up until the one before the current one, I think, has been briefed on the problem. I imagine the current one didn't, he wasn't taking a lot of speeches. Um, but, uh, not, so the, the science is pretty old, and um, so there's, there's kind of two points here. One is that the science goes back a long way. And the other is that, there's, that, that we've been making some predictions uh, that seem to come true. And here's just a, a time series of uh, global mean temperature anomaly starting in 1975. The data go back a long way before this, but this is just showing uh, what was happening up to the, I think it's the third uh, IPCC report. This, is, uh, this was known at the time the forecast was issued. This is the mean uh, forecast in black, and the colored lines are showing you what actually happened. So, for a while, it was starting to look like there might be a problem, but we've had a couple of years of strong warming, so we're kind of now back on the predictive trajectory again, uh, for better or for worse. So, um, we seem to have some predictability. So, what's going on? Well, m most of you will probably know that there are uh, what could be said to be two kinds of prediction. Um, we have initial value predictions and we have boundary value predictions. And so, uh, you can exemplify this by looking at this thing called the logistic equation. How many people here have seen this equation? I'm imagining most people have, but I've actually not seen that many hands. Okay, it's, it was developed to try to model, uh, I think, um, livestock populations dynamically. So the M represents the total, uh, how many livestock a, a patch of land can sustain. Uh, so it's kind of the maximum carrying capacity, and R is the reproductive rate. And if you iterate this, uh, through time, you get, you get this stochastic behavior that, that resembles the, the behavior of the population. You know? So anyway, it's nice because it's just got it's a simple model that exhibits chaos and it has only two parameters in it. And so an initial value problem would be uh, if you start at some initial x, x is the state variable, the number of sheep or whatever, and you, you want to know how many they're going to be 57 um, years later or days later, whatever the time step is. Whereas the boundary value problem is, what happens to the statistics of x if we change n? So let's say uh, we make the field bigger, or put fertilizer on it or something. Uh, what's going to happen to the average population of sheep? Or in the case of an atmospheric problem, uh, this would be what's the forecast for next Monday, and this one could be what, what would happen if we change the oceans, because the oceans are one of the boundary conditions in the atmosphere, and this turns out to be central to the problem of short-term climate. So this is just a couple of integrations of that logistic equation. Uh, the green one is a stationary series where coefficients are constant, which is what we normally do. And then I also tried integrating it where uh, this constant n is increasing linearly with time. And so you can see that um, you can kind of get a sense for the, when the uh, chaos comes in, you hit your limit of predictability by when these things start to 
come apart. But the other thing you can see, you couldn't predict these out here from the initial condition with any, any reliability at all. But you can predict uh, how much the average and, and the range of x is changing as you change m. So we do have predictability, but it's a different kind. So, um, so I'm going to argue that if you want to predict long-term climate, uh, it's sensible, and this is what we always do in this community, to uh, consider an important driver like carbon dioxide, and I think you know why this is an important driver. And then imagine that it's predictable enough that we can almost take it as a known. Okay, so, uh, so for example, there's, there's Bert Boeing's prediction that he made uh, in that year there. Uh, pretty good. And uh, we can imagine that with uh, sort of no mitigation, this is just going to continue up until we run out of coal. And there's a lot of uncertainty as to how much um, you know, uh, shale, oil, gas, uh, clathrates, and all sorts of other exotic fossil fuels might still be waiting for us to discover. So it's actually hard to, to say how far this would go, but at least in the near term, we can predict it pretty well. So what we do, uh, we don't try to predict what people are going to do. We'll, I'll leave that to the economists. It's really, really hard. Social scientists have a much harder job than we do. Uh, we're just going to do a physical prediction. So we're going to imagine that we uh, some scenarios. So one scenario would be we don't care and we just let this go up. Another scenario would be, well, we finally start to care and we try to pull this down. And, we're, and, and there might be some scenarios in between. So uh, as a physical scientist, I'm going to assume that, that the emissions are known and we're going to consider the uncertainty and what happens as a consequence of that. We're not going to consider the uncertainty. So what does this mean climate? Uh, why am I showing you carbon dioxide? Well, uh, it's, it's a big influence on climate. It has been throughout Earth's history. We know that. We have a lot of data um, showing that. And um, this is just a diagram. Sorry, I'm throwing physics at you for maybe not something that other people can have done, but it won't be too bad. Um, this is a diagram showing as a function of wavelength what the flux of radiation going out to space looks like. And the dashed lines are showing you what it would look like if instead of gases in the atmosphere, you just had, uh, I don't know, a solid, a simple, uh, some concrete or something, and um, at different temperatures. And what you actually see is this really spiking structure because of the gases. And you can tell every gas is in our atmosphere. So there's carbon dioxide. It's taking this big whack out of the radiation that goes to space. And, and one reason I'm showing you this, just, it's just in case somebody says to you, well, you know, the greenhouse effect is a nice theory, but we don't know if it's true. It's not a theory. Um, it's, it's observable. We can observe how much energy in, is involved here. And we also have observations uh, at various times over the last few decades, so we can see how much it's grown. And we know uh, that carbon dioxide by itself is currently trapping about a half a million gigawatts of power in the Earth that would otherwise have been get into space if that extra greenhouse gases, gas hadn't been put in. So this is not a theory. It's something that we can observe. Uh, and then, uh, if you believe the first law of thermodynamics, which is a law rather than a theory, then you know that that means that the planet has to warm up, and it's only a question of how much. So these are things that, that we know. And you can actually just use high school physics, sorry, there's a little bit more coming, to take that heat input, divided by the heat capacity of the system, based on uh, how much depth of ocean is warming up, and you can get a temperature rise rate, and you get something of the order of uh, two tenths of a degree per decade. Okay, it's not rocket science, it's just stuff that kids learn in high school. And um, if I take this temperature record now going back to 1880, and I put a slope of two tenths per decade on it, it doesn't do too bad of a job of telling us what's been happening um, since the 1960s or early 1970s. So we could look at this and say, well, this is a super easy problem. They solved it. Why is, why is Sherwood giving me a lecture on this? Um, but there, there is more to it uh, than this. Um, now, one thing that there is, is you see a lot of wiggles here, okay? Uh, can we predict these wiggles? Well, not necessarily. And, um, <clears throat> but we might like to be able to do it, and, and one reason we might like to be able to do it is, I don't know how many of you have heard of the so-called hiatus of global warming, but if you, if you follow climate uh, contrarian communications, then you surely will have, because they've talked about how global warming stopped in 1998 uh, quite a lot. And what they're talking about is this period here, which if you, if you block out all the other periods of time in the record and just look at this, 
um, it, you could sort of convince yourself that there's not really any warming during that period. Actually, it, it depends on what, exactly which data set you use. This is the one from NASA. If you use the one from the UK Met Office, it looks more like a Vegas than this. This one you sort of would say, well, it's still going up a little bit, but it's going up a lot less. So um, now, of course, we, we've, we're starting to get a lot of warming again. And if you look before the so-called hiatus, there was a lot of warming. But there are these variations. So we'd like to be able to, uh, to say why those occur and, and try to predict them. And, um, and so this brings us to the, to the next um, part of my talk, which is on, on short-term prediction. Where do we get, where could we hope to get any short-term prediction from beyond two weeks? And the answer is, uh, we can get it from the ocean. So um, the atmosphere has a small heat capacity, and it tends to radiate its excess energy to space very quickly, whereas the ocean has this huge heat capacity. The, the entire atmosphere has the same heat capacity as the top two meters of the ocean. The ocean is four kilometers deep. So in principle, it's, it's uh, many orders of magnitude more uh, inertial than the atmosphere. And so even just the surface layer here can already uh, carry memory for more than a year. And then the deep ocean, in principle, can carry memory for centuries. Because it really takes hundreds of years for something to go around in a, in a loop from to the bottom of the ocean and back up to the top again. So if we knew something about what the ocean is doing, we could do a, a calculation analogous to the one I just showed you in the atmosphere, but for the ocean, we might be able to predict it quite far ahead. So this is the great hope of climate forecasting. And, and the ocean, it doesn't come totally control what the atmosphere is doing, but it provides a boundary condition to the atmosphere. To the, to the extent that our, web, our, ocean, our weather is sensitive to the ocean, it should give us some predictability. So it's important to know where your predictability comes from, I think. As a physical scientist, it may be easy for me to say that, but it's so, um, so what's going on in the ocean? Well, we have uh, we have El Nino and La Nina. People probably heard of that. Uh, it, it operates on a time scale on a return period of sort of three to five year return period. It's not uh, exact. And then there's a couple others that people may be less familiar with in Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which seems to have a period of 60 to 80 years in a specific decadal oscillation, which is similar but a bit shorter and a bit less regular. These pictures here show what happens in the ocean during an El Nino La Nina cycle. So it's, it's kind of a sloshing back and forth of the surface water. And when it sloshes one way, you get upwelling and cold water on the surface, and the temperatures, the average global temperature drops a bit, particularly in some areas. And then when it sloshes the other way, uh, you don't get that cold water on the surface. You get warmer water on the surface, and the weather moves around, and this sort of reverberates and can affect the weather, particularly in places like the west coast of the United States, but also even in Europe and, and here in Australia, quite definitely. So if we could predict this, that would be helpful. If we could predict these, that would be really helpful. Now, um, how much predictability can you get out of these? Many people are tempted, at least in, in my business, maybe you guys are, are more savvy, uh, are tempted to say that if something has a period <coughs> 60 years, you should, that should give you like a century of predictability. It's, you know, you can, you can break a sine wave forever. But um, a subtlety is that your ability to exploit that predictability depends on the narrowness of the spectral peak. Okay, not on the just on the time period. So if you're dealing with something that's like a pendulum and it swings very, very regularly with a nice sinusoidal character then you can predict it in any cycles, and you've got great predictability. So we can predict uh, the, the uh, Earth's orbit thousands, maybe millions of years in the future. But uh, when it comes to something that's got a sloppy period, and kind of not very, not, none of these is a true oscillation. And, and then you, you start to lose your predictability really fast. And so in practice, uh, you may have six months of predictability for this, or you may have even less than that similar story with these. This is described very nicely in a really nice review paper by Tim Delsol. Um, if you want to know more about this stuff, go read, go read that paper. It just came out a few months ago, and I, I managed to find it just before everybody was talking about the flow of the Okay, so this is more stuff that Tim uh, uh, points out. This is just the framework for how we would think about exploiting this and doing uh, short-term climate forecasting. So, uh, a, a simple mathematical framework is given here. 
where y is our state variable. Uh, I just think of it as temperature, but it could be a, a multivariate state variable or whatever. Uh, we have some observations at a time t. And what we want to know is what's, what's the system going to be doing sometime later tau, later than now, uh, given the observations that we have now and the state, uh, sorry, this is the probability of the future state given the observations now. And um, there's two, and, and what, there's a couple things that, that come out of this equation or that are represented here. One is that uh, we want to make a probabilistic forecast. We're not going to predict the, an exact value for y in the future, because we know we can't do that. What we want to do is predict uh, the distribution of y. And our hope is that we can predict a narrower distribution than the uninformed climatological distribution. So if we imagine that, uh, that the system is statistically stationary, and it's just bouncing around in a track that it's not changing with time, uh, then there's a climatological distribution, and if we didn't know anything, we wouldn't predict that. But hopefully we do know something, and we can make a prediction that's narrow. The other thing that comes out of this is that we don't actually know the current state of the system, which is why. Why is actually a hidden variable. What we have are a bunch of observations, which give us a lot of information about the current state, but they don't measure everything. Otherwise, we would need to have literally millions of thermometers floating around in the oceans, all the way down to the ocean bottom, throwing around the atmosphere, all this stuff that we don't have. What we have is, we have what we have. And it's very useful, and so um, we hope that we can take the state space of the system and narrow it down quite a lot, but it's not going to narrow it down to a point. So we have to integrate over all the possible current states of the system. And looking at the probability of that state given the observations, uh, and then multiplying by the future probability distribution given the, the current, given that current putative value, and then we can get our forecast. So this is what you're doing in principle. This term here encodes the dynamics of the system, so how does it propagate from one state to the next? And this one, uh, it encodes how the uh, evidence is related to the state of the state of the system. And if you're doing this in a weather context, uh, it's basically the same for weather forecasting. This is, this is where the data simulation comes in, and this is where the forecast model comes in. And, and uh, weather forecasting centers spend um, actually most of your time on that than they do on that. It's really hard to figure out the probability distribution of the current state based on a finite set of observations. So um, this is also going to be a problem for climate forecasts. Now, um, we can measure, a, a common measure of how successful you are is a relative entropy measure, which is given here, just the integral of the difference of the logs of, of the distribution. So if your distribution gets narrower, then you're winning. You've got a, uh, a good relative entropy measure. If it's staying the same, then, then you haven't gained anything. And you can quantify what you gain from the initial value here, which is basically the difference between uh, the distribution knowing the data and the distribution not knowing the data. And you can also quantify how much probability you get from the force change. So notice here there's, there's this purple bar because in fact, carbon dioxide is increasing and that's gradually lifting the temperatures everywhere on Earth. And that gives you predictability. Okay, it may not be the kind of predictability you want, but it, it gives you some predictability over the future so that even if you're looking out here where you've you don't any longer have any initial value predictability because it's too far into the future, you can still say that you're going to be up here and not down there by virtue of the fact that there's this secular trend. And this diagram here is something which shows how those two, how the, the amounts of relative entropy predictability vary. So the forcing um, gives you more and more predictability as you go into the future, and the initial value uh, uh, falls off after five years or so, um, the initial condition doesn't really tell you much anymore. Okay, so, um, and there's a crossover here at about 69 years where you start to get more predictability from the performing trend than you have from the initial condition. And this is uh, also from Tim's paper uh, and uh, based on work by Grant Skinner and Tang. Okay. So I think there was something else I was going to say that I've forgotten, but I'll just uh, move on. Please ask questions if you want. I can almost see the whole special type pocket. And, uh, so, um, so you've got two options for getting P. You can either um, try to learn it empirically for past data, uh, or you can use a physically based model. 
and in fact there are um, there are high, there are approaches that are in between too. So the, the extreme case of one would be you, you you use empirical orthogonal mode decomposition to come up with a uh, a manageable number of state variables to describe the system because in fact it's an extremely high dimensional system so you have to reduce it. You can do that with UF analysis or something else, something objective. Then you come up with a linear propagator algorithm by doing regression or something and then you use that to propagate the system forward in time. That would be a, the, the most uh, uninformed um, uh, objective approach. Uh, the other extreme would be you build a model from your equations of physics without looking at any data at all. Um, and then the, the middle one would be that you, and this is often done for things like El Nino, you have an idea about how El Nino works, there's uh, Rossby waves bouncing back and forth in the ocean, so you represent that with one parameter. You have coupling with the atmosphere that you represent with another parameter, a couple more. And then uh, you fit that parameterized model to data. So there's also an intermediate. I'm going to talk today about number two, just because I think there's more, a lot more effort going into this uh, than there is going into that. And we can talk later about whether that's actually the right place to put the effort and, and why it's happening. But, but also because I know more about that. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but there's probably people in this room who have done this. And it's a good thing to do. So um, if you're going to use, if you're going to put together a, uh, a physical model, um, it's a lot of work. And the first fellow who did this was Lewis Fry Richardson. Has anybody heard of him? Have you heard of this effort? Okay, I hope you've heard of this effort. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty good. So he, he did a lot of foundational work on turbulence and fractals, and he had this vision uh, of weather forecasting where there'd be this huge theater, kind of like this room here, except even bigger, full of computers. For him, a computer is a human being with a pencil who uh, does calculations. This is back before we had any electronic computers. And imagining all these people uh, calculating, doing all the calculations that are needed to um, solve the equations of motion on a grid like that. So here was the grid that he used. He tried this in 1922. He didn't have a room full of computers, so he did it all himself. Uh, it took him six weeks to do all these hand computations, solving the equations of motion on each uh, square in this grid. So he's solving this. I'll tell you later what, <coughs> what the equations are that one has to solve. And it was a spectacular failure. It didn't do anything like what, of course, he, he knows the answer because it takes him much longer than eight hours to do it. And he ended up with an answer that looked nothing like that at all. And we now know that there were things that he didn't realize. You, you need a bigger domain. You need to be very careful what you do at the boundaries. So artifacts were being initiated at the boundaries in Washington through the domain and destroying the solution within, within hours. So um, it's not easy to do. But it was a heroic effort, and so we were all very, uh, you know, we, we like to remember this. So um, things got better. We had computers, so we didn't take so many six weeks to do it anymore. Uh, some, of the, some of the figures in the field, John von Neumann, Jill Charney, and uh, Carl Gustav Rossby, uh, came along and figured out ways to do this better, uh, formulate the equations better, figure out what to do with the boundaries, use computers, electronic ones, that is. And so it brought us eventually to what we have now, which is the um, numerical uh, climate model or general circulation model. And what it does is it simulates in three dimensions the evolving state of the system by solving uh, F equals MA, uh, continuity of mass, um, conservation of energy, and uh, doing this on a sphere. And then we have to re represent mixing processes and things we don't really understand very well by a bunch of equations that we kind of make up and then hope that they work. And there's lots of efforts to test them and revise them and so on. But basically, I'm going to get back to this in a minute. This is where the uncertainty is. This is the stuff that we think we understand. But unfortunately, those are the system you need to have stuff. So that's basically what's in a model. This is done at centers all over the world. Um, there are dozens of climate models being run. And uh, in fact, you can get the data publicly. They're, they're available if you, if you want to analyze. I'm going to talk about one experiment uh, right here. And we're getting to our, our short-term forecasting. Can these climate models that I just told you about uh, predict five-year changes? So there is a, um, a particular experiment as part of the coupled model intercomparison project version five, all of which is archived 
available for you to use. And one of the experiments, there's lots of experiments that are done, you know, carbon dioxide increase, historical, and so on. But one of the experiments that's done is you stop the model, initialize it with observations, and then run it for 10 years. And then you go back to the previous simulation, stop it five years later, initialize it then, run it for 10 years. You can do this 10, 10 different times. So it gives you an ensemble of multi-year forecasts that you can then use to test how well does this work. And this is from another nice review paper by Jerry Neal and the American Geological Society from a few years ago, who looked at these runs. And um, these runs are all archived by a, a group at the U.S. Department of Energy, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. And um, if it's still there in a year or two, uh, they'll have seen it since which will be start to accumulate next year. But this is from the existing one. And what they did is they looked at a couple of, of kind of interesting events over the time period. One is a shift in climate that people talked about that occurred around the 1970s. Um, and these are all, uh, let's see, they're, um, I think they're five year forecasts, uh, taking those years minus, uh, minus the, the, the climatology leading up to it. Yeah, six, six to seven year forecasts. Okay, so um, how well can we do six, six or seven years later? And then over here is another case, the hiatus that I mentioned before. Could you have predicted that slowdown in warming that got all the contrarians uh, saying that climate change has stopped? So these are the spatial patterns of the temperature anomaly after minus before. So this is the thing that you would hope to have been able to predict in this case and in this case. Notice there's an interesting pattern in the Pacific. That pattern is none other than the Pacific Decadal Oscillation that I was talking about before, which, which sort of appears very prominently in both of these climate changes, interestingly enough. But on the Indian Ocean, you can see it didn't do the same thing each time. And uh, so anyway, this, this second row here is what the initialized forecasts predict on average, if you average over a bunch of models. And basically, they're getting a hint of it, but they're not getting the whole thing. So there's some skill there. I think that's kind of encouraging. These models, they're not giving you complete junk, uh, but they're under-predicting what happened. This is what the models do if they don't know the initial condition. All they know is that greenhouse gases are rising, and they predict a, a bland, uniform warming, as you would expect, with maybe a little bit of features, but they don't predict it. So this isn't coming from warming. It's not coming from carbon dioxide or forcing. It's, it's the initial state of the ocean propagating forward in time. And I forget about the last row here. Okay, so um, that looks pretty good, but then you look at these figures from the same paper and you find that things aren't that wonderful. And, and the thing is, um, what we're showing here is for the prediction of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, and down here is the Pacific one. Uh, the Pacific one is very prominent in those maps that we just saw. Um, and what this is a, a correlation coefficient, so um, they're actually quite good initially for one to four year leads. They're both pretty good. The solid line here is the multi-model ensemble, so it's the same thing, same thing we just looked at. The dashed line is persistence. If you just assume that whatever the initial state was stays constant. And the colors are the individual models. So the average is looking better than the individual models, and we often see that in this business, right? You average the models and you get a little bit better than one. And they're all better than persistence for the Atlantic, but in the Pacific, they're all worse than persistence. So you're actually better off in the Pacific just assuming that whatever's happening right now continues to happen for the next 10 years than you are trying to run one of these fancy models and pretty how it's going to be more. So this is a bit depressing. Um, but in the Atlantic, at least, they have some skill. Although you would also have some skill just from persistence. You, you can see that both of these patterns are quite persistent at the time because the persistence forecast is still good out to at least five years for the Atlantic, and it seems to be still have some skill up to six to nine years in the Pacific. Okay, so why, what's going wrong? Why, why are these um, not good? I can tell you uh, from work in my own group that many of these climate models do quite a nice job of simulating the Atlantic and Pacific oscillations. They'll just, if you run them, as free models, they will do it. Okay, so it's not that they don't know about the oscillations, but there's a problem when you try to initialize them. And it's a little bit reminiscent of what happened to Rich's. Uh, they're numerical issues. So the, the, the biggest problem is, is the so-called cold start problem. 
And that's because all these free running climate models have biases. They may be a degree or two colder than the real climate. A degree or two is not very much out of 300 degrees. So it's less than a 1% error. But it's still bigger than the signal you're looking for, which might be less than a degree. So the problem is, here you've got your observations. You, you initialize the model to the observations. And then as soon as you let the model free, it immediately drifts down to the model mean. Okay? And, uh, and that drift is larger than the signal you're trying to get, so you're, you're basically stuffed up. And then um, if you initialize it these other times, you have the same problem. Now, there are ways, there are uh, sort of band-aid approaches to fixing this problem. You can um, adjust the observed state toward the model mean before you, put the, before you initialize, and then you can unadjust it at the end. Or you can just not do that, but try to remove the effect of the drift. And these things help. Uh, you can see some dashed lines here showing what happens when you try those sorts of approaches. But it's still a big problem. I think this is the main reason why um, we're not getting much skill. But the other reason may be that, that the predictability of the system is inherently limited. Um, one thing is that empirical models currently, maybe because of this problem, uh, still tend to outperform instantly numerical models for this kind of problem. Okay, a few more minutes. Um, okay so, so what about the long-term climate? Um, you might think from this that, that we understand the force response, but there's a, there's a problem, and that is that what we only understand now is the initial response. And adding greenhouse gas to the atmosphere is kind of like throwing insulation on something and throwing a, a, a blanket or a duvet on this baby. Uh, the first thing you're doing is you're insulating, so, and because the baby's generating metabolic heat, its temperature will start to go up. Uh, and so that's what we've predicted so far. But that's not going to happen forever, because then the baby combusts or something would be horrible. So eventually what happens is, as, the, as, the, as it gets warmer in here, heat starts leaking out, or, it's, or it diffuses through the, the blanket. It finds ways of getting out. So if you want to know how hot the baby's going to get, or if she's going to get too hot or not hot enough, you need to know how the heat flux out of the system depends on the temperature. Okay? And the more sensitive it is to temperature, the, less, uh, the sooner the baby's going to stop warming and stabilize at some new equilibrium. Okay. And, um, and so we need to know what the, fee the feedbacks are of the warming onto the heat fluxes. And we can do that with a linear analysis. So what, what we tend to do is we linearize the system. And don't worry about all this math, but basically uh, this is a way of breaking down the sensitivity into pieces. So one piece might be uh, how much air flows out around the blanket when it gets warmer. Another one might be how much flows through the blanket. Or does the baby throw the blanket off when they get hot? That would be a negative feedback. So in the atmosphere, we have feedbacks from clouds, from water vapor, and from ice. And all of those things are things that when the temperature changes, the thing changes, like ice might decrease. And the decrease in ice leads to an increase in reflected uh, and absorbed radiation. And so we put that all together, it makes a feedback. When you add them up, it tells you uh, how sensitive the energy budget is to the temperature, which you should invert it, tells you how sensitive the temperature is to a perturbation in the energy budget. Okay, and we define this thing which we call climate sensitivity that I'm going to be talking about more, which is how many degrees of warming do you get from doubling carbon dioxide? And it's just the um, ratio of dt by dF with the appropriate units. And incidentally, if you go out and buy insulation at Bunnings, uh, it comes with an R value, which has exactly the same units as these feedbacks, watt per meter squared per column. So there's really a close analogy between the feedback analysis that we're doing and if you're going to insulate your house. We're adding insulation to the earth by uh, emitting CO2. Now, the linearized thing might bother people if they know about climate records like this one, which show all this chaotic behavior. You might think that the Earth's system is just as chaotic as the atmosphere and should be unpredictable. And that may be true on very long time scales, but we think that these lurches of temperature all involve um, changes in ice mass and the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica, which we think take centuries. So we hope that uh, we don't have to worry about any of that for a while, and we don't have any reason to strongly doubt that, uh, that this sort of simple approach is at least roughly useful for the next few hundred years. So that's what I'm going to rely on. Now what difference does it make uh, the way these feedbacks go? Well, here's a projection of global warming into the future. And this range here is the range of uncertainty because of the feedbacks and not knowing how far it goes before it stabilizes. <laughs> 
And then these two groups here are two different scenarios. Remember, we're, I'm assuming that we know the scenario, so we're making conditional forecasts, conditional on a particular scenario. There's what is conditional on, on a high emission scenario. There's what is conditional on a very low emission scenario. Uh, but it's still a big, a big range of, of outcomes. So we need to know this climate sensitivity. This is basically high climate sensitivity, low climate sensitivity. So how do we know? Now we're getting into the realm of um, predicting something that we haven't directly observed ever. Uh, so one way is, is use theory. Use those models I was talking about. Ask them. Um, another way is to go back and look at the historical warming that I showed you and say, well, what, what sensitivities are consistent with that? And then a third one would be to go back and look at the ice ages and the ESC and all these time past times in Earth's history and try to look at ratios of temperature to influence and get it from those. Well, it turns out um, we're, we're, all, we're actively working on all three. They're all interesting. They're all important. Uh, none of them, none of these two are strong enough to really tell us precisely what the answer is, at least not yet. There are too many um, unknowns in the forcings, the historical forcings, and there's too many uncertainties about paleoclimate to be able to read off the value that we want. And what I'm going to do today is going to talk, what if, what if you didn't even have these at all, and you just had to do it theoretically? Uh, I don't, maybe some of you are in the position where you have to forecast something in a situation you've never encountered before. What do you do? You have to find other evidence, analogs or relevant information that, that helps you to, to make some educated uh, judgment. So uh, I'm going to talk about that. Now what we're trying to do is put a probability distribution on this climate sensitivity parameter, which is shown down here. And um, typically this is done using a Bayesian approach. So we start off with a prior distribution, and we could argue about that for a while. It's an interesting question. And then bring the data to it and then get a posterior distribution. And this is just an illustrative calculation. So we're not, we're trying to, we're trying to put the uncertainties on this really. We know we're not going to know exactly what the climate sensitivity is from one distribution. So if you don't know it and you have to do it um, by, by theory, there's basically three things that you can do. Uh, you can start with a model like the ones I've been um, discussing, which uses information in physical laws, and then ask it what the climate sensitivity is. Uh, you can also do something which we're now calling emergent constraints. If you have a lot of models, uh, you can look for relationships between the uh, thing predicted by the models and something that you can observe. And then the third thing is you can do a purely empirical approach. So you could, again, fit a some kind of statistical model to the system and use that as a value. Now, all these have weaknesses. This one might take forever before you have a model you really believe. Uh, and I'll tell you about some of the, the limitations of these um, but, uh, in, in, in a moment. So if we look at this, at this one, um, this is just from a paper that I wrote. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to talk about the mechanism. But what, what's important is that we found that there was a relationship between the um, climate sensitivity in a bunch of models. And so here's a list of modeling centers colors tell you where, whose model it is. And this is a thing that you can observe in the present day climate, which we argue uh, should be related to the cloud feedbacks that control climate sensitivity. And, and what we found is that there's a decent relationship here. And that means if you, you can go out and measure this, and it will tell you something about the climate sensitivities, and that's where the measurements lie. So it's actually telling you that the climate sensitivity is high. Now, what, should you believe this? Um, it depends. You need to understand it. I would say we had an idea for what was going on, but that's not necessarily proof that it's correct. And the other thing you need to worry about is what if all these models are missing something together? Uh, they could all be wrong. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a useful approach, and a number of other people have come along with other things on the x-axis, and oddly enough, they've all pointed at, at high climate sensitivities. So this is something that's telling us that global warming might be worse than the average model tells us. So that's one um, approach that you can try. Uh, the other approach that you can try is to do things purely empirically. And this is basically a cautionary, a short cautionary story. There's a, a long history of people doing things empirically in this business. And I'm a fan of empirical predictions when you can test it. If you're doing you know, forecasting like the weather or short-term climate, then you can run it on past data and see if it works. But it's much more dangerous 
when you're trying to do it in a situation where you have no way to directly test. So this is from a, a paper written uh, some time ago where they, they wanted to know how does the greenhouse effect depend on the surface temperature. And so you, if you graph it regionally, you get a nice relationship. You can fit a line through it. But it turns out that if you run a climate model, it reproduces this. But if you then run it in a warmer climate, it doesn't move up the curve. The whole thing shifts to the right. So if you thought that this was some kind of law of nature, you'd be wrong. And people sort of, some people did think that. And it's, the, it's, a, it's an error due to a confounding factor, which is that locally warm temperatures tend to suck in air and moisture and add to the greenhouse effect. It's not because it's warm, it's because it's the Laplacian is high. It's warm compared to the neighbors. So there was a mistake in, in a confounding factor. Here's another one. Um, famous uh, climate skeptic Dick Lindzen from MIT claimed in 2001 something which he called the iris effect. <clears throat> and it was based on the fact that he observed when it was warmer in a certain part of the Pacific Ocean, it was less cloudy. And so data like his are shown here in red. But again, we looked at a few climate models and found that they don't all do exactly the same thing, but they tend to do the same thing if you look at them in that region. But again, when you run these models in a, in a warmer climate, they don't move down the curve. The whole thing moves to the right. And in this case, it was an error of causality. Uh, Dick is assuming that this is causing this, but in fact, the changes in cloud fraction due to other reasons are controlling the surface fraction. So you have to know the causality to resolve. Now, if you go back to the uh, paleoclimate data, you might think that if you know how much cooling there was uh, during an ice age and how much forcing it took to produce it, you took your ratio, that might tell you the climate sensitivity. And, um, but it doesn't do a very good job. Here's a scatter plot. And so I'm calling this an emergent non-constraint because you actually thought that it would constrain it, but it doesn't. And I'm not going to go into the reasons, but it's because there's complexities that people haven't thought of that can affect um, the temperature change you use, that you simulate 20,000 years ago during the Ice Age, other than the climate sensitivity itself. If you just look in the tropics, it works better. Okay, so, so there's a couple lessons here, uh, at least in, in, in climate. One is that if you've got an empirical approach, uh, what I've been showing you is that you can test it on simulated data. If you've got a sophisticated model of your system, use it to generate simulated data and t test your empirical approach on that, see if it gives you the right answer. This is something that not people haven't always done in the climate community, but it's something that I'm always telling them that they should do. And there may be people in this community who can do that, although obviously you, don't, you often don't have a physical model, but if you do, uh, this is what you should do. And the other recurring theme is that local relationships between points in a complex three-dimensional um, system are often misleading. So I'm going to close with an approach that we've used to get around this problem, and that's to use something called the fluctuation dissipation uh, theorem from statistical physics, which basically says that in simple systems, if you look at the variability in a system, you can predict how it will respond to a mean, to, to, a, to a, a, a pressure. For so for example, um, you could look at the variability of a mass on a spring and infer the spring constant. And once you know that, if you apply a force to it, you know how much it will move. So if you want to predict how it's going to be, the, the boundary value response, you can look at the variability and tell. At least it works in simple systems. And so we've applied this. This is a formula for it here. It just it involves calculating in its simplest incarnation the, the uh, lag covariance of the system and, and doing that. Um, people have been thinking about applying this to climate for a long time, but they've applied it to the global mean temperature. Trying to predict things from the global mean temperature alone is really hard. It doesn't can carry a lot of information. The stuff I've been showing you before on, on short-term prediction was all based on patterns. Uh, but so what we're trying to do is apply it also to patterns. And uh, this is all work that's been done by a student of mine, David uh, Fuchs. And he has um, come up with a few innovations like state space reduction that you need to do uh, and, multi and using a multivariate analysis rather than just looking at one variable like temperature. Uh, and, um, and we've looked at the responses to given ocean surface temperature patterns. And he's found that it works pretty well. So we're hoping that we can use this to predict regional responses to ocean temperatures. So here's an example where this is the true response to an El Nino-like ocean temperature change, where red is showing uh, more rain and blue is showing less rain. And this is what he gets with this fluctuation dissipation operator, 
appears to be using three variables, temperature, relative humidity, and wind, and, and if you use fewer, it doesn't do as well. And then here's what you get if you apply it to hot spots of ocean temperature. Here's the true response. If you put a hot spot there, you get uh, more clouds, and same there, and same there, and same there. And you can do a reasonable job, but, but this is actually a hard one because it doesn't look very much like an actual variable. Uh, and then here's what it gets. Um, doing it on the seasonal problem. And uh, one, one objection to this sort of approach is that the system's not stationary because of the seasonal variation, but we actually found that we could get more skill that way because you can use the seasonal variation if you construct your operator appropriately. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm done now. Here's my conclusions. Uh, there, we, regional climate predictability on short time scales out to a few years is possible, but it's limited. Um, and we have some modeling issues uh, with physical models, but there's a lot of interest in trying to overcome them. So there's a lot of work going on. I think in the long term, they may have more promise, but in the short term, empirical models are better. And we should be relying on detailed complex models to test simple ones and statistical approaches. I think that's a, an important lesson. Uh, at longer times, we can predict global warming from knowing the climate sensitivity. And there's different ways we can get at that. Uh, but the empirical ones need to be tested, so that's the same point as here. And um, unfortunately, latest evidence is pointing to higher global climate sensitivity. I didn't show you all that evidence. I showed you a bit of it that I've done, but there's other evidence that's pointing in the same direction. And I think we do have statistical approaches that we can use for regional responses while we wait for perfect models. So I'll take any questions.